Oh. <laughs> so we are officially live. Um, so welcome everybody. Eklanete, Dene Sotlane, Ariel Seekwe Huche, Durange Betsy and Hasli. My name is Ariel Seekwe uh, Durange, and I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, and I am the Executive Director of Indigenous Climate Action. And I want to thank you all for joining me here today for this webinar. Um, today's webinar is on Indigenous rights and the UN conventions. So over the years, Indigenous peoples have been participating within the UNFCCC or the United Nations Forum Convention on Climate Change for decades, participating largely on the sidelines and bringing many Indigenous participants from across the globe to bring forward our concerns about our rights and the interconnectedness we have to the environment and the natural world and how climate change is impacting our communities and what our people and our knowledge systems, our values and our life ways have to contribute to addressing the global climate crisis. However, it can be very confusing. Um, there's a lot happening. Climate change conversations at the UN level are going to be continuing next week in Spain, Madrid for the COP25 or the Conference of the Parties. This is the 25th year. And understanding the critical role that Indigenous peoples have played at these meetings for over two decades and the ripple impacts they can have on localized com communities, like our own communities, can be confusing and overwhelming. But you're not alone. So today we are joined by three individuals, Andrea Carmen with the International Indian Treaty Council, Graham Reed, who works with the Assembly of First Nations and is also the co-chair to the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, or the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, and Janine Yazi, who is also with the International Indian Treaty Council, um, who have been participating in the UNFCCC processes for years. They are going to help us understand some of these processes, how Indigenous peoples have participated in these processes over the years, um, what the current Indigenous Peoples Caucus is doing in the lead up and during the COP25, and how this impacts our local communities and how we can take this work on ourselves. Our first speaker today will be Andrea Carmen, and Andrea is, a, is from the Yaqui Nation, and she began her work with the International Indian Treaty Council, or the IITC, as a student intern in San Francisco in 1976 and has been a staff member since 1983. Andrea has many years of experience working as a human rights trainer and observer around the world and was IITC's team leader for work on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 2006, Andrea was the rapporteur for the UN expert seminar on Indigenous peoples' permanent sovereignty over natural resources and their relationship to land. The first time an Indigenous woman has been selected to serve as a rapporteur for a UN expert seminar. In addition to that, Andrea has been an expert presenter at UN bodies and seminars addressing human rights, treaty and treaty rights, cultural indicators, biological diversity, food sovereignty, UN sustainable development goals, Indigenous people's rights to participate in decision making, Indigenous children under state custody, including impacts of boarding and residential schools, climate change and human rights, pre reproductive and international health, international re repatriation and cultural rights, Indigenous languages and the rights of the child, including Indigenous rights to environmental health. Most recently, in February of 2018, she was selected by Indigenous peoples, tribes, and organizations in North America to serve as their representative on the new facilitated working group for the development of the UNFCCC, Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Traditional Knowledge Exchange Platform, platform for its first three years of operation. Andrea comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience working at the UN level in multiple different bodies and particularly brings this expertise to the climate change discourse. In addition to Andrea, we also have Graham Reed. And Graham Reed works with the Assembly of First Nations as a senior policy advisor, where he, where he has had the opportunity to represent the AFN at the COP23 and the COP24 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And he is in preparation to attend the COP25 in, in Madrid. He is currently the co-chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, or the IIPFCC, which we'll talk a little bit more afterwards. In his free time, he is a doctoral, <laughs> in his free time, yeah, he's a doctoral candidate at the University of Guelph, studying the intersections of Indigenous governance, environmental governance, 
and the climate crisis. He is of mixed Anishinaabe and European descent. And last but not least, we also have Janine Yazi. And Janine is an entrepreneur, community organizer, and human rights advocate. She has worked on climate change, water security, food security, energy development, and nation building with indigenous communities for the past 11 years. She has served as a research associate with the Gold King Mine Spill Study led by Dr. Carletta Chief of the University of Arizona that looked at the impacts to Navajo communities. She is a program manager of sustainable community development with the International Indian Treaty Council. She also represents IITC as the co-convener of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group to the United Nations High Level Co Political Forum on the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. She is the co-founder and senior planner of the Little Colorado River Watershed Chapters Association and co-founder of the Puerco Valley Uranium Task Force. She serves on several boards and advisory boards for organizations working on food sovereignty, water security, and land rights nationally and internationally. She is also, just as a point, she's also from the, she's Dene from the South or Navajo. And so we have Dene, Dene from the North, that's me, and Dene from the South. And we are actually related and we have many common words in our languages. So our people have spread out across the nation. And I'm really honored to have you all here today to help us understand just what Indigenous peoples have been doing for decades within these UN conventions and bodies, and how important our knowledge, our voices, and the work that we are bringing forward is to these systems. So with that, I'd like to start today's uh, webinar with a presentation from Andrea Carmen, and I'd like you all to just do your own introductions when, we, when, you, when you queue up. And we will have slides, um, and we're getting them started right now. So Andrea, if you want to take over, thank you so much. Nelson Chokutesia, Ariel, Chaniawo, Uma Wayaim. I want to give respectful greetings to all my relatives and thank you for uh, organizing this um, webinar and I look forward to, to sharing uh, with you all. Um, first of all, um, I want to stress that our work at the UNFCCC, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that's the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And um, I hope you all bear with us because the United Nations likes these long names. And so the only way to say them is these abbreviations that um, nobody understands unless they're immersed in, in uh, UN speak. But we'll try to be careful and, and say it out. But you know, there's a direct link um, to being at the United Nations um, with the, the rights and ways of life of indigenous peoples. And we always say, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. So we need to be, you know, at our tribal governments. We need to be at the local school board, state legislature. Some of us go to the Congress and some of us um, make those impacts and speak for our peoples at the United Nations. So that's what the International Indian Treaty Council was founded to do back in 1974 on the Standing Rock Reservation to carry that voice of our nations and peoples, um, our knowledge holders, our youth to the international arena to see if we could get our rights recognized in that way because there was not much recognition um, in that, at that point um, and maybe not still today at the level of um, the nation states. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about is bringing our traditional knowledge um, into the discussions on climate change. And I like the phrase, our ways of knowing better, because it talks about that ongoing relationship. Traditional knowledge sometimes sounds like a thing that's done and it's over here. Whereas our way of adapting and knowing about what to do and respond to climate change is based on that continual relationship that we have. And this altar, this corn altar is just one example. Um, and that is the four sacred colors that all indigenous peoples, and at least in this hemisphere, share the four that stands for the four winds, the four directions, but it also stands for the bio, biodiversity and the natural varieties of corn. Um, and our peoples, our Yaqui peoples, and I think many indigenous peoples 
knew um, from various ways of our own ways of knowing how to how to know ahead of time uh, what the climate was going to be like hot year cold year dry wet so we knew in advance what kind of corn to plant what color of corn to plant and this also speaks to our rights as well because um, our rights to protect those seeds and to access our traditional lands and waters and other resources are also a fundamental um, to protecting our food sovereignty and ways of life in this time of climate change. So I, I love this picture because it speaks to all the different levels that we're um, taking with us uh, into the discussions internationally on climate change. I'm trying to make it go forward, Nathan. It's not doing it. Do I do this from here? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, she read out all these accomplishments, but technology <laughs> wasn't one of them. You should be able to do it from your computer. You should maybe, Nate, can you do it for me? Can you move the slides forward? Because it's not doing it. Um, maybe we should restart the, the so sharing. Un so unshare, so let go of your share and then restart it. Unshare. Okay. I'm sorry, folks, but, um, let me let me try to try to do this share and reshare. Um, now just see if you can move to the next slide. Okay. No, it's not doing it. I'm sorry. I need your help, Nathan. Can you make it go forward? You can't. You have to do it because it's just from your computer. Can okay. you just click on each box? And maybe that go that way. Um, yeah, let me try to see if I can. Yes, that worked. There you go. Very good. Very good. Okay, just a word about the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change that um, back, way back at the first Earth Summit where Indigenous peoples were recognized as one of the major groups, one of the nine major groups around the world that were key contributors to discussions on the environment. And um, sustainability, um, the, the awareness that uh, climate change was um, forming to be a global crisis um, was recognized. And this, this convention, as well as several others addressing the environment, uh, was born there. And indigenous people so have been uh, participating from the very beginning. And now we're at COP25, which is 25 years um, after the first meetings to discuss what the content should be. But throughout our participation, these are just two examples. Um, in 2009 and, two, and um, 2010, at, at and the COP means Conference of the Parties, and the parties are the countries. So um, we've been facing um, a continual problem in getting our voices included, even though everybody came to recognize that Indigenous peoples were the most directly impacted by climate change, and that's still a recognition today. But we weren't even allowed to get in the room for the negotiations, even at Paris, when they made the Paris Agreement that recognized our rights and, and our traditional knowledge as key to this discussion, we weren't even allowed to participate. Um, so these are marches that we had with indigenous peoples uh, to protest our exclusion as real participants from the process. Uh, the basis for the rights of indigenous peoples um, uh, since 2007 has been uh, that minimum standard. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I know you all have your pocket-sized copy of the bedside um, version of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So when we talk about the rights of Indigenous Peoples internationally, this is as the floor. It's the minimum standard. It's not the ceiling, but it is the basis by which we can't fall anymore. So when we're working at um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, forgive me, I'll say the UNFCCC from now on, um, we also are affirming our right to participate in decision making that affects our rights. And that's Article 18 of the UN Declaration. 
Uh, we're also affirming our right um, that is in Article 29 to environmental protection and maintaining and preserving and protecting the capacity um, for uh, production in our traditional way, our productive capacity of our lands and resources, including uh, very essentially our food sovereignty. Uh, we're also uh, affirming um, the recognition for our traditional knowledge, which is in Article 31, which also considers our traditional knowledge and cultural heritage to include seeds, um, cultural expressions, knowledge of flora and fauna, and all of the elements that allows us to um, be adaptive to what we're facing here for the climate crisis. Of course, we want to stop it, we want to reverse it, but we're also understanding that the knowledge uh, in our traditional knowledge passed down will allow us to survive. And these are some of the, the things that the countries are recognizing too. This, by the way, is my husband here in Tucson on our family farm, um, teaching one of the young tribal members how to protect um, uh, the, the plants, that's a pomegranate tree um, from a coming eclipse um, of the full moon. Uh, also, very importantly, and this was very hard fought in the process of working on the UN Declaration, is the recognition of our traditional lands, territories, and resources. Um, and that states shall give legal, legal recognition uh, to the protection and demarcation of these lands. And of course, Article 32, free prior informed consent. This is a right that we insist on. Uh, as we know, some of the countries like the United States say that they recognize only the right to consultation, but this says that they must um, engage in consultation in order to obtain our free prior informed consent. These are not the same things. And of course, this is a, a demonstration in the United States against the Keystone Pipeline. So this is also a way that we can um, keep on fighting to reverse and protect um, ourselves against, against climate changes to stop fossil fuel development, um, leave it in the ground. So consent is a treaty, right? I just want to highlight this in both Canada and the United States. Uh, this is uh, from the Fort Laramie Treaty, um, the, the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which was the first uh, international document we took to the United Nations, um, maintains that um, nobody is supposed to be able to come in from outside onto the treaty lands without the consent of the Indians first obtained. Other rights that are very key to these discussions for us as Indigenous peoples are Article 25, Indigenous peoples' spiritual relationship with our land, and of course, uh, the right to, to food sovereignty and subsistence. And this is one of the main impacts we've seen. And this is just one example. This is when we went to Paris, the indigenous peoples on the Columbia River um, told us they'd lost 80% of the salmon return. And even back in 2009, the UN Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous, um, or Right to Food, I should say, uh, recognized that this is climate change, the single biggest threat globally to uh, food security. So when we went to Paris and building up to the creation of what we have now, a new UN body addressing these issues, um, we did consultations with indigenous peoples throughout um, Canada and the United States and actually got input from leaders um, that represented about 318,000 individuals as well as um, community-based um, food producers, um, knowledge holders, spiritual leaders, to hear what do they think about traditional knowledge and climate change. And actually 96% of them affirm that our traditional knowledge could be very useful in combating climate change. This was the Indigenous Peoples Pavilion, one of our elders, um, Chili Yazi, talking about from the Navajo Nation, the Dene Nation of, of Arizona and New Mexico, um, how they're using traditional knowledge. Another example that we took there is the ro role of the restoration of our traditional food sources. And um, this is pictures of a, a out of season blizzard that happened in South Dakota in 2015. Um, blizzard happened, snowstorm happened before the ranchers had taken the cattle in. So in, in early September and um, 100,000 cows died, but not one single buffalo 
which the tribes here are, are restoring that were wiped out by the US government, but they know how to survive in drought and blizzards. And um, there's a strong relationship of our traditional foods and the restoration of our food sovereignty, our cultures and our ability to adapt um, and survive climate change. And another example that we took there is seed trading that all the way, this is indigenous peoples from Oklahoma, Mexico, and Guatemala that are actually trading seeds with each other at one of our international corn conferences. And so indigenous peoples can trade for drought resistant seeds or seeds that grow very quickly. And these are all traditional seeds. And we used to trade with each other. That's how corn spread throughout the whole hemisphere. So it's very important we revitalize those relationships. And of course, elders teaching our youth is very key. This is Alaska um, showing the wild plants. So when we got to Paris um, for the 21st conference of the parties, um, this is the Indigenous Caucus. Uh, we had about 200 Indigenous peoples there. We protested, we had press conferences, we lobbied states, and uh, this is, um, Chief Bill Erasmus, also from the Dene Nation in Canada, and we're chanting, we are peoples. And uh, another core um, demand is we join with the small island states to demand that global temperature increase um, not be above 1.5 degrees centigrade, because even the scientists recognize in the small island states and the coastal states, except for maybe the United States, that even at two degrees of warming, the um, lifestyle and ways of life of indigenous peoples, our livelihoods, our food sources would be severely impacted. And last year at, at the 24th Conference of the Parties, um, they said in 2018 was the highest level of emissions ever um, in history, even despite the commitments the countries made, the states made at, at um, COP21. And that's, that constitutes maybe three degrees uh, at the current rate and maybe nine degrees in the Arctic, which is, um, you know, devastating. It's a, it's a crisis situation. So quickly, uh, what we achieved at COP21 um, in 2015 is the first time that the rights of indigenous peoples have ever um, been included in a legally binding um, environmental convention at the United, United Nations. And also uh, it was implemented um, in paragraph 135 to bring about a platform for exchange of um, knowledge for, from indigenous peoples and local communities and also a commitment to strengthen this knowledge. It wasn't just a matter of sharing, but how are we gonna be able to protect and preserve these ways of life going forward? So based on that, the big question was, okay, there's this platform be called, um, being called for, how will it look? How will it be implemented? How will our rights and, and ways of knowing and knowledge be protected in this process? Because we all know, you know, what happens when we share with those that don't understand what sharing means. So um, these are just a couple of the consultations we had with state governments in this process over about three years. Um, this one, the top one is in Ottawa. Um, the last one was Cochabamba, Bolivia. We also had one in Finland and in um, Belgium. But we also, very importantly for the International Treaty Council, consulted with indigenous people's food producers and traditional knowledge holders and spiritual leaders about whether we should even do this, or whether we can do it. Um, and they all said the same thing, that they understand the level of the crisis and why countries are finally turning to us, because they're in a panic, really, if they, they're listening to their scientists. But we said in order for us to participate, our rights have to be protected and our traditional knowledge and ways of life have to be respected. So um, that was the voice. Um, and, and this is this is just the quote where we came about with the term uh, ways of knowing um, from Ontario, Canada, a meeting of elders. And they, they were saying the same things, that they're demanding that Canada uphold its international agreements to keep emissions down and that uh, um, treaty rights and rights of Indigenous peoples need to be upheld. Um, and free prior informed consent, they said, as understood in our ways of knowing.
our interpretation of how these things are understood. So we took all that into the United Nations process and were faithful to those messages. And we had this massive victory, kind of unexpected even, um, last year at the 24th Conference of the Parties in Katowice, um, where the facilitative working group was formed to take this process forward and to formalize it and to make it operational. Um, which was, it was a huge, it was a huge victory, but we, we achieved our, our goals of equal participation between indigenous peoples and states. And for the first time we were able to select um, our own representatives. That's never happened at the UN before, even at the permanent forum and other places. Um, also the resolution respects in its entirety, the UN declaration. It gave us an estimated budget of a million dollars a year. We'll see if we can come up with it. Um, but it also uh, left us with the challenge of ensuring rights safeguards uh, before we bring our traditional knowledge to the uh, holders of the table um, to advance this. We have had our first meeting um, of ever the facilitative working group and there are seven indigenous members, one from each of the seven regions and seven countries on it. And the rest of the folks here were observers and you know had their input into the discussion. And we developed their, um, uh, this, this is a, a, a course from the Amazon and I just wanted to throw it in there because it shows the relationship between the violation of the rights of indigenous peoples and um, the increase in climate change that the burning of the Amazon forest is an example of. So we need to keep bringing those voices in if the states um, get off track. Uh, we also got a really strong resolution at the UN Human Rights Council um, recognizing the human rights impacts on indigenous peoples of climate change and also recognizing the um, great step forward that the creation of this new body at the United Nations uh, to discuss the not just the impacts of our traditional knowledge, but also how we can have this input um, into climate policy uh, across the board globally and also nationally. Um, this is a support statement from um, the National Congress of American Indians here in the United States, also recognizing the importance and committing tribes to participate in this process. And the last uh, slide is um, just to say that our, uh, our work plan was achieved through some struggle because we have to come to consensus, seven members of indigenous peoples, uh, regions, and seven members of, of countries. Uh, but we all agreed that we had to have a right, rights-based uh, approach with rights safeguards, that we want to look at cross-cutting impacts and policy recommendations on how our knowledge can be used to form climate policy and inform it. Um, and halt the, the increase of um, greenhouse gases, that we insist on direct participation of indigenous leaders, knowledge holders, and practitioners. We want activities at uh, the local, national, regional, and international levels where there can be full participation, even by folks that don't go to the UN. We want knowledge sharing among indigenous peoples and not just with states. We need to come together to talk to each other about these matters from different regions. There has to be a free prior informed consent basis. We want to build capacity for our indigenous peoples, but also for countries to even understand indigenous people's point of view. And we need direct funding. So these are um, the things that we're, we're um, moving forward with. And um, I just want to uh, end with that, that this, this shows what's at stake, our food sovereignty, our land, and our future generations. And we keep that in mind as we move forward. So um, thank you so much and um, hope for some questions. Thank you so much, Andrea. You know, it's, it's so interesting to see like the history and the arc of how indigenous people's participation has grown over the years. Um, I think it's really, really important to understand just how, how critical it has been for indigenous peoples to be a part of this facilitated working group. And that has, it has come 
at a lot of the hard work and tenacity and the continuation of us showing up in these spaces. And, you know, Andrea, you mentioned in 2015 um, at the Paris big meeting where the Paris decision was made, there was protests and all this stuff that happened on the side. So it wasn't like by the good faith and the goodwill of states, but by the continued perseverance of Indigenous peoples and largely those that have participated in the Indigenous Peoples Caucus that really pushed and drive this agenda home. I remember I was in Paris and, you know, working with the caucus and we tried so hard every day. We were fighting state leaders that tried to get the removal of Indigenous rights and knowledge out of the text, but we maintained our position. We worked really, really hard in the streets, in the, in the convention centers and in the negotiations. And it's been such tremendous outcomes that have come from all of this. So with that, <clears throat> I'd like to invite Graham to share with us a little bit more about what the Indigenous Peoples Caucus is <laughs> and how they function and uh, what the plan is for the COP25 in, in Madrid coming starting next week. Great, miigwech Ariel, miigwech Andrea. I always uh, feel so lucky um, sharing the screen with such, uh, such badasses. So uh, miigwech for that. So I mean, uh, Graham Reed, Indigenous Cause, Ottawa, Nonjaba. Uh, my name is, is Graham Reed. As you can tell, I have a few things going on. Um, but, but today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, International People's Forum on Climate Change, talk a little bit about its role in uh, enabling space for uh, Indigenous peoples from around the world, using the example of where I work at the Assembly of First Nations, and then share a little bit about um, what's upcoming at COP25, and I think Andrea did a really excellent job summarizing the bulk of work, which, um, and this is the only time that I'll reference any sort of literature, but there's an Anishinaabe uh, academic at UBC that talks about like a, uh, a subtle revolution, uh, an Indigenous subtle revolution, and I think it's a really interesting concept to think about how opening up spaces like the facilitative working group can do that to um, you know, make space in institutions that aren't ours. And that's, I think, one of the things that, that the Indigenous Caucus does a really good job of, is, is making space in, in what is a state-led, um, very kind of um, nation-state perspective that, that, is, um, that often erases indige you know, Indigenous nations and, and our rights. Um, so I wanted to start just, just with me. So I mentioned I, 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 lived in, I live in Ottawa. Uh, I, I um, escaped for a long, long time, about eight, eight and a half years, and then came back to start working for AFN. And I've been working at AFN for about um, almost four years now. And then as, as was mentioned, I've, I've started school and done some other things. But I just wanted to, to highlight the importance of, of centering youth and how, how important this mobilization, and this was the Montreal mobilization with over a million or 500,000 people um, was to kind of revitalizing my spirit in the face of um, such challenging circumstances. And that little arrow and that little paddle is, is, is where I was standing. Um, so as I mentioned, talk a little bit about the history, talk a little bit about a case study, and then maybe a bit more about COP25. So um, as uh, Andrea shared, um, Indigenous peoples have been participating in the Conference of the Parties for a very long time, much longer than I've uh, been around and been involved in, in this space. Uh, Kenneth Deere still has some of the original badges that, that he um, used from uh, earlier than 1992. So when, when uh, chiefs visited the UN in, in the 50s, um, asking for space and indigenous participation. The, the indigenous constituency was formally recognized in 2000. Um, and then it was organized loosely into the IIPFCC in 2008. And essentially, the point of the IIPFCC is, is to coordinate Indigenous folks attending, um, discuss priorities, uh, negotiation items, uh, events, actions, um, and, and look to hold space for Indigenous peoples in these environments. It does not attempt to um, take over any uh, individual Indigenous person's perspectives on the climate crisis. So the intention um, that, that one of the teachings from Saskatchewan, actually, that, that I like to think about 
is a teaching about the grass dancer, which is you're opening up the space for ceremony. And I think any sort of uh, organization like the IIPFCC, like AFN, is essentially opening up space for First Nations, for tribal nations to participate and raise their voice. Um, and the last thing is that in that entirety, since the original um, Conference of the Earth, there's been about 60 uh, decisions that have been adopted by the COP. So not only those that Andrea raised specifically around the Indigenous Peoples Platform, but other uh, decisions that are referencing Indigenous peoples and referencing traditional knowledge, referencing Indigenous adaptations. So there's there's a significant amount of information that that is um, held within the UNFCCC pertaining to Indigenous peoples. Um, so I wanted to share some of just loosely some of the messages that that the caucus normally advances, and and just to note that the caucus is inclusive independent of, of who can get there. And so figuring out solutions on how we can open up these spaces to be more inclusive for those who may not be able to participate in that you know, set event is something that I think everybody on the call is really keen on, on figuring out. And, and this, this webinar is an opportunity to start thinking about those linkages that, that we can start to make collectively to ensure that you know, space is open to amplify those concerns where, where possible. Um, so, as, as Andrea mentioned and, and others will mention, a uh, significant amount of emphasis on the recognition and protection of uh, our knowledge systems, our science, our innovation, our ways of being, um, emphasis on ensuring that Indigenous peoples uh, have full and effective participation, um, recognizing that the challenges that Indigenous peoples are often confronted are in these state-led spaces that you know, follow the fixed box that is uh, the rules and procedures under the UN. Um, so advocating for inroads such as a facilitative working group to enable this full and effective participation. I think Indigenous peoples are, are committed to this concrete action. And, and Andrea shared the call for, for 1.5 degrees. I, uh, I, I do remember the calls preceding that, which was, which was one degree. And then the global community decided on that 1.5 to 2 degree future that, that was um, identified in the Paris Agreement. And then, uh, of course, the, the importance of um, protecting, safeguarding, upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples as recognized in the preambular language. And this is something that's been contentious over the years. So um, what in the, in the AFN context, how do... How do Indigenous organizations, First Nation organizations, um, how does the caucus enable them to bring their message? And I was just going to share some of the things that the AFN is working on uh, that, that will likely be communicated at COP25 through the various mechanisms that we have. Um, so for many uh, folks, if you, you likely know what the AFN is, but it's a political advocacy organization that advocates for the recognition, protection, and inclusion of First Nations inherent treaty, constitutionally protected rights, title, and jurisdiction. Uh, we're a representative organization of 634 First Nations, um, Indian Act bands across the country, um, and essentially get direction twice a year through chiefs assemblies. Um, so one in, one in July and, and generally one in December that provide direction for folks like me which works in the, the secretariat to advance the missions that those chiefs and assembly have identified. And I, I use um, some of this information, I think it's an interesting time, um, and I'll share it in the next slide, where I mean, all of these things are finally converging together to mobilize that mass um, um, political uh, and public uh, interest in addressing this climate crisis based on the things that Indigenous peoples have been raising for um, thousands of years, hundreds of years. Um, I, won't, I won't say that. I was going to use another academic reference, but I won't. Um, so First Nations are increasingly declaring these climate emergencies. Uh, we had one in May from the Vanta Kwichin First Nation, which then informed uh, the declaration of First Nations climate emergency that I'll talk about in a second. Essentially, Canada's climate, based on this report, which is the Canada in a changing climate, has warmed about double the magnitude of the rest of the world. 
And in the north, it's about double and a little bit. So 2.3 degrees since they've started tracking temperature. And then in, in that original slide, there's a million Canadians led by First Nations. You'll note that Indigenous youth were at the front of, of that march. Um, and, and that will continue to do that. There's another march, just a small plug, next Friday. So November 2029th, which is the global climate strike. So encourage folks, and, and I know we'll likely be participating in Madrid um, to, to advance that as well. Um, so this, this, this resolution was passed at the most recent Chiefs Assembly in, in July. And it essentially declared a First Nations climate emergency and then identified three things uh, to, to work on to advance as, as part of this, this mandate. Um, the first is uh, what I would kind of classify as, as advocacy, uh, particularly to uh, federal, provincial, territorial, and international governments to take action uh, to reduce emissions by 60% below 2010 and reach net zero by 2050. So in line with hopefully science and hopefully folks attending COP25 will listen to the science uh, despite some of the challenges that certain states like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, like Kuwait, may, uh, like the United States, uh, may not recognize um, the, the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And then the other two things that were identified was uh, the development of a, of a national climate strategy um, and also a hosting of a, of a national gathering. And so we'll be hosting a national gathering in Whitehorse March 3rd and 4th of next year. So let me know if, if folks are interested in participating and you can, um, we'll, we'll, we'll contact and provide more information. And in, in that strategy, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is kind of advance a bit more of a First Nations lens on climate change. And that is, um, you know, instead of, like the UN kind of um, creating silos and creating climate as something separate from our day-to-day -day lives, really thinking about it as something that uh, we look through to understand how climate crisis is actually accelerating and exacerbating these existing, existing challenges. So things like you know, biodiversity, language, conservation, food security, um, our, our indigenous knowledge, uh, culture, et cetera. And, and by, by considering you look through that uh, lens, we can, we can figure out what those root solutions and problems are. I'd love to get to a situation where, you know, language revitalization is, is a, an act of resilience in the face of, a, a, you know, a rapidly changing climate. And, and, you know, thinking about how do we support intergenerational knowledge transfer on the ground in our communities as, you know, building resilience in, a, in the climate and being able to, as Andrea said, get the resources to support that. Um, and then also connecting this healthy environment to everything else that is connected to our day-to-day -day lives, our health, our well-being, our mental health, our culture, our language, our water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then thinking about these solutions as, as multi-dimensional, multi you know, interconnected and interrelated instead of, you know, being very siloed like uh, the UN tends to be. So what... What's happening at COP25? Um, I have two brief slides on this and, and would be keen to you know, respond to any questions. Um, so essentially, many of you know, uh, it was changed from Santiago to Madrid. Um, I'm, I'm sure folks will have uh, perspectives on that. Um, I, you know, I think from our end, uh, our efforts through the caucus to ensure that those indigenous peoples now located in Chile and also in Latin America have as much space possible to hold states accountable for, for the injustices that are facing um, their people back home. And what we'll continue to figure out what are the best solutions to do that. It's, uh, it's considered a, a technical COP and there are certain items that are up for negotiation. Andrea mentioned the draft work plan, which, is, which will be an important uh, hopefully success if, if uh, all goes to plan. The other issues that are coming up and probably the most sticky and challenging is around the negotiations for Article 6, which is essentially uh, the creation of an international carbon market. And there's a variety of different um, complexities associated with that, but 
the, the you know, communication that I think many of us have shared is the importance of maintaining those minimum human rights and indigenous rights safeguards to, to ensure that it doesn't uh, adversely impact even more our communities throughout the world. The other thing is, is the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, which um, has been a mechanism to explore some of the effects of um, you know, either rapid onset events, which are basically natural disasters, or slow onset events, which are um, things like coastal erosion, things like thawing permafrost, um, uh, sea level rise, these things that are slowly, um, and it's difficult for folks to attribute a single event and then uh, plan for um, any sort of response mechanisms. And so there, there's um, this mechanism that is responsible for doing that, the caveat, though, is that it's um, intended only to occur in, in those developing countries, and I'm, I don't love that term, um, but also that it won't discuss compensation. So, you know, these two factors are um, slightly challenging for those Indigenous peoples located in the global north that are facing very real loss and damage effects. Um, I, I use the example of Lenox Island that we visited, you know, a couple maybe a year ago now, whose island is, is they're, they're facing a situation where they're going to be forcibly re relocated. And like, so the, the kind of arbitrariness of this loss and damage framework is, is slightly concerning, but looking to open up spaces within that to have these discussions. And then also looking up, how do we take this international framework for loss and damage and apply it in the national context? Um, which I think would be very interesting in, in the Canadian context to think about what that looks like. And then the final priority is, is really laying the foundation for next year. And next year is the year where parties are required to update their nationally determined contributions. And those are essentially, they're, they're um, sharing their climate targets to the global community. And so in order to, um, you know, meet the targets that the that our elders are telling us meet the targets that the ipcc is telling us the canadian canada and a changing climate canada really and the us which i guess is a different circumstance really needs to uh up, up their game in terms of their their ndcs and so there's there's a lot of probably foundational work now that that would help support that also um there's uh, other conversations about how do you guide those other countries in supporting indigenous participation in the preparation of the NDC, which is a, another um, potential dimension of that. Um, and then what, what does um, you know, indigenous people's involvement specifically at the COP25 look like? And this is non-exhaustive. There's many side events, many actions, many other things that are planned, but just providing a bit of framework around there, there will be a preparatory meeting uh, on the afternoon of November 30th and all day on December 1st. Uh, every day we have an Indigenous caucus within uh, the UNFCCC area to discuss those strategies, to coordinate, to identify events, speakers at events. And then this year, just like um, this was in COP23 with uh, Elder Francois Paulette and, and Frank, at the both of which might might also be attending this year, that they just were able to share uh, their knowledges and their experiences around the changing climate. Um, so we also have a pavilion that will enable that and will also hope to uh, amplify those indigenous voices from Latin America as well. So that, that, that's an important emphasis for us. And uh, so that, that's it for me, Chimiguich. Uh, Chimiguich to, to Ariel, Andrea, and Janine, and, and look forward to see any questions and, and those folks soon. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, I just want to sort of like recognize that while Andrea, Graham, Janine, and myself have spent a lot of time inside of these negotiation sessions, having these kind of dry conversations with lots of acronyms and big long names, you can see that the one of the common threads uh, that Andrea talked about and even Graham has talked about mobilizations and how these are part of the revitalization of our spirits when we come together. Because even within these structures and systems, while we are getting, you know, making headway and we are having impact and we are moving forward 
there are still challenges and dangers that exist within this around safeguarding our rights, our knowledge system so that we're, our rights are not co-opted. Um, in the link below or in the chat below underneath this, um, this, this webinar, I have posted some links to some information on Article 6 and human rights. Uh, understanding carbon markets and some links also understanding uh, more about indigenous participation within the UNFCCC. But it's really important to understand that these these negotiations have direct impacts on our communities locally. And a lot of this is that what happens there affects what happens in our own communities and what, um, how we can make progressive change within our own communities, within our own states, within our own region on understanding how indigenous rights, knowledge, life ways impact climate solutions on the ground. Graham talked a little bit about that, all the different ways in which indigenous knowledge and indigenous life ways and knowing can affect different types of solutions that are outside of the scope that most state and colonial governments are, are looking at right now. And that's why it becomes so important within the context of Article 6, which is a technical piece that looks at ways in which we can create solutions for the implementation of the Paris decision at the state level and ensuring that our solutions as Indigenous peoples are not just recognized, but that they're valued at the same level as science and other technologies that will affect our communities on the ground. Now, Janine Yazi has a ton of experience with not just participating within the international mechanisms and bodies, but what that means for communities on the ground back home. So I'd like to hand it over to Janine to share with us a little bit about what this work means for us back at our, in our own local communities on the ground. Yeah, thank you. My sister Dine. Um, yeah, a Shikero Shidine, Shia Janini Azi and Shia. Um, I want to thank my colleagues for their excellent comprehensive presentations that they just shared with us. Um, because I think it makes it a little bit easier to contextualize why it's so important and why um, we're trying to create uh, programs and content like this in this webinar to get more people involved in these international discussions even if you can't physically be there. Um, just a, a brief background, you know, part of my work in the Southwest United States but also in the U.S. as a whole is has been in helping indigenous communities and tribal nations address the impacts of climate change. And we know through that experience and through just our history of advocating for rights for our peoples and our rights to self-determination and respect and honoring and upholding our treaty rights, that we often come to these walls that are, have been created and are deeply a part of these colonial institutions, um, which have justified and continued to carry out the theft and um, destruction of our traditional lands, territories, and resources. And that's why it's been so important for indigenous advocates and engaging in these international mechanisms to hold that ground and ensure that we're participating in these international conversations mm -hmm. um, because with the work that they've been able to do from the establishment of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, from opening up these pathways for Indigenous Peoples' participations in, in strategy and in negotiation processes, um, we have been able to create um, these international articulations and legally binding mechanisms that help us overcome the barriers and challenges that we face locally for um, getting resources and support and protections for our traditional ways of um, ecological stewardship, for our traditional ways of uh, restoring and protecting and transferring our knowledge systems um, from our older generation to our younger generation, um, but also it's created more pathways for us to um, overcome these barriers to self-determination and um, that's really necessary for for our people to be able to promote the solutions that are needed in our communities. Um, being a part of the negotiation process last year at COP24 in Katowice, Poland was really was really important because one of the um, agreement around the establishment of the facilitative working group was not only phenomenal and historical 
historic based on what Andrea shared in her presentation and us um, gaining for the first time equal representation with states. Um, but it was also notable because it was the only human rights framework and mechanism or agreement that came out of that conference. And I think that goes to show how important and how vital indigenous people's participation is in these, in these um, uh, fora in order for us to not only uh, protect our rights and to push further for uh, better advancements and better protections for our peoples on the ground, um, but to also hold the international community to higher standards and um, to ensure that they are not um, reneging or trying to continue to uh, create the separation between the climate crisis and uh, its connection to our human rights as, as a whole. Um, indigenous people's rights are human rights, and we've been able to bring into these conversations not only that stance, but also, as, as Graham shared, um, our unique perspective and lens that looks at this issue and this crisis in a holistic manner. And this is vitally important because on the ground in our communities, as we're struggling for climate change solutions, I'll give you an example of um, just working within the U.S. Um, those solutions and the resources made available to our communities are often constrained by the frameworks and priorities of the federal administration. And when you're working under an, an administration that is denying the, the gravity of the situation that we're facing when it comes to climate change, but is also uh, further marginalizing um, the rights of indigenous peoples to participate in decision-making decision processes, um, around development that affect our communities, our peoples, our lands, our sacred sites, um, and our other territories and resources, we really need the language um, that is accepted and adopted by all these countries and these foras to hold them accountable domestically on the ground. Um, and in this case, the Paris Agreement, you know, um, as Andreas said, even though we were unable to um, participate directly in those decisions, the advocacy of the individuals that were there did get the mention of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples included in the preamble. And so now here in the US, when we have this disconnect between the federal administration and state governments who are sort of stepping up to the plate to uphold the Paris Agreement and uphold um, these climate change commitments, we now have a mechanism and language to hold those states also accountable to um, pr including indigenous peoples within their territories are within their states in those decision-making processes and so it's up to us really how um, how much we can gain from these from these international advancements in these conversations by applying it to our own everyday work on the ground and that's why it's so important even if you don't get a chance to attend these conference of the parties or other international fora to pay attention because the information has to be um, made public it's available online and all these websites, um, but also to build those um, uh, pathways of communications to with indigenous organizations like International Indian Treaty Council, um, Indian Climate, um, uh, International Climate Action, oh my god, I said it wrong, <laughs> AFN, and all of these organizations that are, that are um, uh, in, engaging in these processes um, so that we can share information because that that's ultimately the goal is that we need to get people involved we need to get people informed and engaged um, but we also need to share knowledge among each other and strategies with each other that will allow us to use these advancements to our utmost benefit uh, because we, we know we know that the the um, the crisis is at hand, it's been at hand. We know our communities have been struggling with this for generations since, um, and we know our communities have always known and seen the link between colonization and the climate crisis that we're dealing with. So we have a better understanding of the root causes and the root issues that we need to address um, for systems change in order to really build um, viable, efficient and effective solutions uh, that help us mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. And so um, with, this, with this work and with this outreach and with increasing our communication and, and the accessibility um, to information uh, around these events and around these negotiations, I hope that we can build um, a, a more informed indigenous communities and tribal nations um, and, and how to 
use these uh, advances to better inform strategy and solution building at the local level. Um, and, and so I think that uh, there's some questions coming in and we wanted to ha have some time to interact with the, um, the people who are viewing the webinar uh, in order to address those questions. And so I'll end it here. Thank you so much, Janine. I know like Janine has been so busy working on in multiple different things. She's been <clears throat> really involved with some of the sustainable development goals, um, which are the SDGs. And there's really interesting work happening within those bodies that have impacts on how our states and our governments are creating laws and legislation to try and meet those goals um, that do have deep impacts on us. And it's really important for us, as Janine said, to find ways to share with each other, not just across in these international forums, but locally in our own communities to build that effective systems change. When I hear, when I heard Janine speak, one of the things that sort of came to mind was this story that I heard of, uh, you know, it was a prof, it's a prophecy story, an indigenous prophecy story that came from Alaska. And there was, it's a story in relation to the last ice age. And in the last ice age, indigenous peoples across Turtle Island saw the changes in the land. And there was a call for all of us to come together and gather to share our knowledge and our understandings and our relationships to the different places in the land and collect that knowledge and likely share seeds and do some of the things that Andrea talked about and look at the changes in a more holistic way. And it was told that, that we needed to share those things. We needed to drop our wars, drop our conflicts, and come together to find a way to survive the coming changes of the land, which was the last ice age. And it was prophesied at that time that another time would come when great changes would be upon us in the land, but it would be much harder and it would be much worse. And we would once again have to drop our conflicts and our wars and come together to share our knowledge, to share our understandings of the natural world and find ways to find those solutions that we could all use to survive that coming change. I truly believe that we are in that time and that we have to look at this in a more holistic way. And I really think that one of the biggest challenges that we're up against, and Andrea talked about it, was the fact that we are talking about business as usual in the energy sector, particularly with fossil fuels, and that we absolutely must advocate for a keep it in the ground strategy for fossil fuels and uranium, which um, Dene's from the north, understand and the Diné from the south understand we have seen the extraction of resources from our territories for far too long and we absolutely must not allow this to continue so we do have some questions coming forward but i i thought this was a really good question that we we came up with first so i'm going to start this and maybe janine you can answer first and then andrea and and uh graham you can as well but how can indigenous peoples who don't go to the cops in these international meetings and aren't a, you know, a co-chair or a part of the working groups on all of these different bodies, how can they participate in these processes and get involved, either locally, nationally, or internationally? Well, I'll share my own pathway into getting involved. And um, it starts off first with, I think, I think what was helpful with me, for me, um, really educating yourself on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and using and, and recognizing how the language in, that, in the declaration applies to your own work at home and the issues and challenges that your communities are faced with. Um, from, that, from that pathway, uh, it's opened up a whole um, a set of doors for looking at ways to bring local projects and local solutions to these international conversations. And for me, I reached out to International Indian Treaty Council and was able to get involved in their work because we already had these ongoing local projects that were addressing these issues that we're facing. And we were already linking it to the UN Declaration and how these, were an, um, these acts were an exercise of our rights on the ground locally. And I think that what's been really beautiful 
uh, about the, the way indigenous peoples have been engaging in these mechanisms is that it's always been done with a very inclusive and comprehensive approach to ensure that no indigenous communities, whether they're recognized or not unrecognized, are no indigenous peoples, whether you know they're they're connected to their to their tribes or to their nations or not, um, would be excluded from understanding and from being able to protect and advocate for the rights of who they are as indigenous peoples. Um, and so the the pathways are there. I think that um, all that is is needed for that first step is to just uh, educate yourself on these on these mechanisms, starting with the declaration. Um, uh, connect with uh, whatever fora is most relevant to your work. For me, it, because it was about climate change adaptation and mitigation, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and the Conference of the Parties, the UNF Triple C, um, were two of the most relevant international mechanisms. But there's also um, when you look on the, the UN website, it's really interesting to see how many international fora um, take place and how many different mechanisms are out there um, because it, it's really the, the, the content matter is, is, is really broad. You know, there's the International Business Forum on Human Rights. Um, there's the Miramata Convention, um, which is about mercury. Uh, all of these things um, have some level of indigenous people's engagement and largely through these organizations that have first uh, have been responsible for championing and creating these pathways to participation and so International Indian Treaty Council on their website has a whole lot of resources that not only show that history of engagement and all of the different mechanisms that they're involved in um, but also uh, ways that in, in local events that people can get involved in um, and, and contribute what their issues are what their solutions are and become part of that strategy development um, but this year, and maybe Graham can speak more to this as well, um, and, and obviously you too as, as well, Ariel, um, us, a group of us are working on developing a comprehensive communication strategy so that we can use and harness the tools of social media um, and of the existing websites that do share this type of content in order to make information more accessible, but also to start to solicit input in real time from, from indigenous peoples doing this work as the negotiations are going Going on and I think that the only thing that we, we need um, to uh, honor and uphold that work is for people to just to just do that homework and to to get involved and to make that commitment to follow these processes um, because they can get a little long but <laughs> if you if you get that commitment you'll learn a lot in a short amount of time and we'll do our best um, and you can help inform our strategies to ensure that it, it is accessible um, that it is uh, inclusive and and, and that um, we are we are improving our own ability to create these pathways for involvement. Thank you, Janine. Uh, Andre or Graham, do you have anything you want to add to that? Andre, you're muted. Still muted. There you go. Oh, hi. Thank okay. You. Technology, right? The, the young ones do better with that. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, one priority of the International Indian Treaty Council as a representative indigenous organization with affiliates all the way from Alaska down to South America, Pacific um, and Caribbean, it's, it's, it's who we are to seek out the input of um, indigenous peoples on the local level, our knowledge holders, um, our, our leaders, uh, but a real key issue here for us as well as intergenerational knowledge sharing within our nations and within our regions. Um, we've had, for example, four International Corn People's Conference beginning in Mexico, uh, Guatemala, and the United States. The last one was in Tlaxcala, Mexico this year. And we talk about solutions and recommendations on the international level, um, but also as important and maybe uh, more important, what we can do together as indigenous peoples, like you say, seed trading networks or, or sharing um, uh, solutions among each other, but also within our peoples, you know, bringing youth and elders together to start to actually do it and not just talk about it. Um, I want to introduce, come over here. He just took a big bite of apple. This is um, Chris Honani. He was at one of the youth participants at the um, uh, corn conference in Tlaxcala and on the youth panel where we had youth representatives. He, he's Hopi. Um, 
from uh, Northern Arizona um, and works here in our office now uh, since the summer. But uh, also he was invited by the Global Youth Caucus um, as the only, I think, delegate from so-called developed country from um, the Americas or from Europe to attend uh, a youth delegation this, this year, um, just a couple months ago, for the UN Convention on Desertification. As a desert young farmer, he was able to take that knowledge in um, to inform another UN process that's directly related to our work on food sovereignty as well as climate change. So it's really about giving opportunities to young indigenous peoples. I started out this work as a student intern um, for the International Indian Treaty Council. And I think that commitment needs to be um, highlighted because uh, that's the only way that we're going to make sure that those that are the most impacted by climate change, those that are young today and their kids, um, have an opportunity to be part um, of these discussions. So when we do these different, we've had salmon conferences, we've had two in the Pacific with youth and elders coming together to talk about what their view of their food systems and how that's impacted by climate change. Um, and we're having an Arctic one uh, on caribou and reindeer coming up in March that'll be in Finland. So very important for us. Um, this work doesn't mean anything unless it has an uh, impact in our communities um, for indigenous peoples on the ground, but it also isn't gonna go very far unless our knowledge holders and young people are also um, at these bodies, at these tables, and letting us know and the states and the countries and the United Nations know what must be done, what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank hi, Chris. You. Say hi, Chris. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Graham? Yeah, um, not, a, not a ton to add, but I'm, I'm reminded of um, one of my, my Nish aunties who works with me that talks about kind of concentric circles of climate action. And essentially what she talks about is, you know, you start with the individual. And I think that's the point that, that Janine talked about in terms of raising your own um, confidence in understanding what are these very jargonistic and technical phrases. And then we can communicate those to our families, our communities, and then our nations. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that we try to do at the caucus is, is try to support that individual understanding and then enable them to, to, to build confidence to share that with other people. And that's why I'm really happy this time about the, the large amount of like youth and young um, Indigenous peoples that are attending and, and can um, build that awareness back home as they do that. But the, the point about the calm strategy is equally important that Janine raised. And we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best way to use some of the IIP FCC tools. So we have a Facebook page that many of you may or may not have seen. We have a Twitter, we have a website, um, and we're looking to develop like an Instagram to figure out how we can you know, interact and bring stories from back home to these environments that um, are, are international in nature. And the, the final thing I'll say is I think the beauty of the work plan that, that Andrea talked about was that emphasis on, on regions and regional workshops and engagement. And so, you know, whereas there's like, you know, significant costs or barriers to participation at this, this kind of global level, given just location, time, et cetera, um, figuring out solutions to help decentralize that into, you know, our nations and our communities and back home and hopefully through some of the work of the facilitative working group, we can begin doing that. Great, thanks so much. Um, we do have a few questions and I just wanna make sure that we get to some of the questions that folks had. Um, one of the big questions that came up, which I thought was really interesting was, um, does the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples apply if your country hasn't accepted it and can sovereign tribes uh, basically use it for their protection if they if their country didn't sign on to it? Like basically, does un, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples apply if your state doesn't wasn't a signatory? But there's only I don't know if there's any countries that are not at this point. Maybe you can answer that, Andrea. The four countries that voted against 
um, the UN Declaration's adoption when it was uh, adopted by the UN General Assembly um, have all reversed their positions. So no state in the world, you know, for those listening in the United States, states means countries when we're talking about the, the UN, doesn't mean like California or Arizona. Um, but uh, no country now opposes the UN Declaration. Uh, a few of those that abstained have not reverse their their abstention russia is one of them russian federation um however with that with the u.n declaration that was overwhelmingly adopted at the u.n general assembly it's considered to be in force and we just had this discussion with the u.s state department at at a conference actually on international repatriation where the state department was trying to tell us the kind of old tired line that it's not part of international law it's um, just aspirational because it's a declaration, but nobody would say that about the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. There's no country that would say it doesn't apply to them. That the more we utilize it, um, the more it does become legally binding. And there's lots of examples, including that the UN Declaration affirms many rights that are already affirmed and agreed to by many countries through their nation to nation treaties with indigenous nations, including. US and Canada, of course. Um, but also that declarations are part of international law. They just have a different character than say a convention, which does need to be ratified. A convention or a covenant um, like the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the ICERD, um, does need to be ratified, but a declaration does not to be considered in force internationally as long as it was adopted you know, by such a, a great number of states. So also it's important that we utilize it. And many tribe, tribal nations have um, endorsed the UN Declaration and some countries have also made it part of their legal framework um, as well. So, and it's used in court cases and, and many other things. So um, I would not um, hinge uh, your definition of your rights or your ability to assert them on what the position of the country you live in is because there's nothing in international law or the UN declaration that says that countries, that states have a right to limit the implementation and application of the rights in an international document such as the UN declaration. Yeah, there was a the sort of a follow up question is like, but these, these, the UN declaration is not legally binding in many of these countries, even though they support it. So how do you utilize the UN declaration if it's not a legally binding, um, you know, UN mechanism? Well, theoretically, the, the conventions and covenants are legally binding, but states also choose to ignore them. And I love this idea that that um, actually one of the one of the representatives of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission uh, was there when we got together after uh, when he was the UN Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, James Anaya. Um, after he finished his tour of the United States and submitted all his recommendations, um, they said. Um, you know, various, so well, the recommendations were great, but where's the teeth in this process of the United Nations? How can you make the countries do it? How can you make the countries that agreed to the Paris Agreement actually reduce their emissions to keep um, warming to 1.5 degrees or less? How do you make them do that? Where's the teeth? And he said, he was asking himself, where's the teeth in, in the recommendations of the UN Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples to the United States? Then he said, I suddenly realized, you know, we're the teeth. There is no teeth if we don't, you know, put the teeth in this process. So um, the United States hasn't turned in its mandatory legally binding report to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination for that convention in two and a half years. And what's going to happen to them? You know, we need to enforce that and bring on friendly states, which we do, um, to make sure that these um, agreements are implemented. I've just been in two countries. One was the pre-COP in Costa Rica, 
a couple of months ago, and one was Scotland that held a climate heritage mobilization uh, conference in October. And both those countries have a commitment on the state, on the country level, to reach zero emissions by 2040. You know, they can do it, but they need to be pushed. Great. Oh, Janine, you're muted. All right. I just wanted to add really quickly that um, one of the things that I've seen locally is that the first step was for tribal nations to adopt the declaration, but now we need to be more specific about how we codify the articles of the declaration in every existing policy and, on, and throughout our legal frameworks um, if our tribal nations have them. And I think that's an important step forward, but even if you're not from a recognized tribe, or even if you're not like working in that capacity with the with the tribal government, um, you can also do that directly in policies and in and, uh, agreements with allies. And doing that, incorporating the articles of the declaration in your nonprofit work, in your coalition building, in your movements. The more we do this, we make the teeth. Uh, that that enforces not only how this is implemented, but um, ensuring that we're doing it in a way that benefits and, and, and ensures that we're using this in the way that it was intended um, and in a way that supports our movement and our rights at the local level uh, across the board on whatever issue it is that we're working on. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I really try to get across to, um, to everyone that we engage with, um, whether they're working with tribal government or whether they're working at the state level to work through all of these mechanisms that policies are developed in order to bring that language in. Um, and a huge uh, um, piece of that is ensuring that in all of our work, no matter what level, what state, what, um, what level of government our organizational building, um, that we uphold the right to free prior and informed consent um, as it applies to indigenous people's lands, territories, resources, our well-being. Um, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to emphasize. Great, thank you so much, Janine. Graham, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, great. I, I think it's really, really important to understand that the UN Declaration has come up in this conversation, even though we're talking about climate change, because it is a fundamental document to understanding how our participation is received um, and why it's so critical to the negotiations on climate change. And I really, really think you need to, to do as much research on that as, as you can. Um, there's a lot of questions about like how to get involved and we kind of touched on that. And I think I just want to summarize it so folks can, can hear this. Do your homework, understand what's happening at these levels. We provided a lot of links in here. We're gonna to work to share some of these slides from the presenters so you can like click through and see some of this stuff. But it's important to understand that there has been a ton of work. One of the participants in the call said they were at, they were at the 2005 COP, COP 11 where they did the Arctic Declaration. In 2009, there was the Anchorage Declaration. There have been declarations after declarations asserting indigenous people's rights and our knowledge and our ways of being, how they're so critical to achieving climate stabilization and the pathways to climate stabilization. And in every country, there are ways to participate. I know in Canada, we have the AFN has hired climate change coordinators in every province and within the First Nations of many different First Nations across the countries and Métis and Inuit settlements, there are climate change coordinators reach out to your local community to find out what's happening because there is a lot happening and you can get involved. And I also just Ariel, want to I have just two comments okay. on that. Um, one is that many tribes uh, and tribal nations in the U.S. are beginning to look at developing climate um, strategic plans which involve bringing in traditional knowledge holders, youth, dealing with alternative energy development, dealing with um, uh, natural disaster planning, um, all of these aspects. We've been, I've been working directly with the Rosebud Tribe and the Sichangui Treaty Council there to develop theirs, and they're looking at having a, a climate crisis center you know, where all of these things can come together and people could come and talk about these things. Yeah, also, um, we're promote, we have on our website a um, template for tribes to adopt, begin to adopt a discussion about development of a climate crisis um, 
response plan, a strategic plan. The other is I've just heard that the city of Tucson, Arizona, which is where we are sitting right now, is also developing a city plan. So I want us to be involved and involve the tribal nations that are in this area in the development of that plan because there are many, many opportunities to get involved without having to go to Bonn or Madrid or any of these other places, you know, including working with your own tribe to make sure that there's a, a strategy in place that involves traditional knowledge holders, restoration of food systems, um, voices of youth, um, all of these aspects can be there, and those listening can play an instrumental role in making that happen. And if you're not from an indigenous nation, you can go to the city council where you live and make sure they have a plan um, that includes the voices of community members. I think it's really important to talk about cities engaging with indigenous communities because we often think of cities as the places where non-indigenous peoples are and like the reservations or the rural part where indigenous folks are but that's that reality is quickly shifting and a reminder that all cities are atop of indigenous lands and territories the entire continent of north america is indigenous land uh, that is shared uh, via treaty agreements that have been broken time and time again and so we have to recognize that this is this is very much so like we, we are on indigenous land uh, i think a question uh, targeted Maybe Graham, you can answer this, but like, how is the Indigenous Caucus, Holy, the IIPFCC, what is their engagement with the Global Indigenous Caucus, uh, and how do they interact? Because I know maybe you can answer that, and then we can. I think we'll just have to wrap it up after that. So yeah. Yeah, um, and and quick answer: a lot of our Indigenous youth that participate in the Indigenous Caucus also participate within the the Youth Con Caucus, and and similarly. Like we have representatives that participate in the Women and Gender Caucus, also the uh, the Human Rights, um, also the Research Institution. So there's a lot of kind of cross fertilization. Um, but, but if if you're interested in making those connections, I, I think um, folks will have my email and stuff, and and keen to to follow up with that. Also, just noting, uh, I had a question about the national gathering. So that that there'll be a call for um, sessions that will come out in the next couple maybe a week or so. So uh, with more information about how to register and stuff. I, I also think that these types of forums and this webinar is to also help address some of those challenges for us understanding what's happening within these bodies. Um, we, we will also share any questions that you come up with afterwards for those that are watching this after this webinar is done. If you have any questions for Janine, Andrea, or Graham, we welcome you to send them towards us. We will forward them on and try to answer your questions as best as possible. Keep in mind though, we are all going to Madrid next, <laughs> like at the end of this week. Uh, and so we will be a little tomorrow. bit busy. <laughs> Some of us are leaving Sorry, tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but I did, I did want to give all the speakers just a moment for any closing remarks that they have or suggestions or words of advice that they have for folks. Um, um, and we will wrap it up from there. So Janine, Andrea, Graham, any closing remarks? Uh, yeah, just thank you again for helping organize this webinar. I think it's um, really important to bridge this gap and to make this information accessible to everyone. Um, so those for to those of you that joined us and stayed with us for this whole thing, um, please stay involved. Uh, obviously, you've already showed that initiative and that that um, self motivation that you are interested in this. This is resonating with you, um, and so if there's any way we can uh, continue to support your involvement in your ongoing education, definitely reach out to us. Follow the IPFCC Facebook page and social media accounts, as, as well as ICA and IITC. We'll be sharing content on, on all of those um, platforms. Um, and so uh, we, we could use your help in also sharing that information and, and continuing this conversation with your own families, your own communities, your own organizations, and bringing them into this fold. And if there are any questions on like strategy or further training, um, you can definitely reach, us, reach out to us at Inter National Indian Treaty Council if you're based in the U.S. or across the Americas because um, we would be happy to facilitate that. I will comment that a lot of this work could not have been achieved without um, the 30-year struggle that we went through to um, get the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted. It's the only 
international human rights instrument that deals with collective rights, rights of peoples rather than individual rights, including the right to self-determination. So um, I think that is a stepping stone by which we're impacting a whole lot of different UN bodies and fora, because it also says the UN is supposed to implement it. And to keep that in mind, um, somebody asked me a specific question about the template. It's on our webpage, which is, uh, you can Google International Indian Treaty Council or it's iitc.org. And it's in the section on environmental health, um, climate change. So you can find it there. Thank you. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's tough to follow uh, these two legends. Um, but I, I think the only thing I would add is um, don't feel like the global level is the only place where things happen. In fact, I, I think it's the place that things don't happen and what really motivates kind of transformational change is, is work in our communities and, and folks on the ground. And so, you know, keen to, to support those linkages and uplift, you know, those experiences to motivate folks in these kind of boardrooms who often are very disconnected to the, the items that they're talking about. And so, you know, encourage and, and you know, thank Ariel, Janine and Andrea for, for sharing all this wisdom and then also looking to um, how do we ensure, and, and one of our, our Maori relatives, you know, talks about like, how do you see those people beh behind the words being negotiated? And that's one of, I think, the most important things that Indigenous voices bring to these scenarios is that, you know, there are people behind these and there are, you know, life experiences and, and that we, we will continue to try to honor them. Um, and then, yeah, like uh, reach out whenever try to make those connections um, through our social media channels and also let us know if there are things that, you know, we can try to amplify in those situations that are going on in your communities. Everybody um, really loves seeing, you know, indigenous leadership. And, and, you know, I know our caucus is really emphasizing how to um, switch that narrative from victimization to leadership, just like we've been doing for the last, you know, tens of thousands of years um, and, and making sure that voice, you know, folks in, at the COP and in those boardrooms understand what that leadership really means. So Kimi Gwich and, and look forward to, to any questions or comments or, or collaborations that come about. Thank you so much, everyone. And I think on that note, just talking about indigenous leaders that are standing up against fascism, corruption, uh, intimidation, uh, war crimes, we absolutely, I don't want to I can't end this webinar without recognizing the fact that right now in the global South, in South America, we have seen repression come down heavy on indigenous peoples within Chile and Santiago where the COP was supposed to be. And we absolutely stand in solidarity with those that are at being, there's massive human rights violations in Chile right now against Chilean people and attacks on democracy and their struggle for social, social justice. And we absolutely must call against those things. And a lot of this has to do with climate Climate is changing and there's, there's all these actions to try and address this to equalize economies rather than equalizing and stabilizing life on planet Earth. And that's what we saw in the reaction in Chile. And now most recently, the, the coup in Bolivia that has been a direct threat on the lives of in, and the rights and the recognition of indigenous peoples where many people are being murdered every day. We also saw uprisings in Ecuador and indigenous peoples, we are being criminalized for standing up for our rights, for our fundamental rights and recognition of who we are, to be a part of developing the pathways and solutions, not just to stabilizing local state economies, but to stabilizing planet and reconnecting ourselves with the natural world. So I just wanna last shout out, we stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the global south and the world over that are fighting repressive, repressive regimes and standing up for the rights and recognition of indigenous peoples. And to my colleagues on the panel, I will see you all in Madrid um, mm -hmm. on the weekend. So thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, lots of links. We'll be sharing stuff with you guys later on. Thank you so much, Masi Cho. And we're out. We're out. Okay. <laughs> While you were saying all this repression of the global south, now we're going to Spain where it all came from. <laughs>